evening we're going to uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, as we continue in our study on how to put off sin and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're basically looking at uh, the means of grace, but we're doing it much more quickly than um, we have been in the series that we've been looking at, the 52 reasons why we should read the word, why we should pray, why we should fellowship, and so forth. We're not so much looking at, at why, I suppose, as much as, as how uh, we are to do these things that we might grow strong and might become more like Jesus Christ. Well, here's another principle found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. This is what Peter writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Therefore, beloved... Since you look for these things, and he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Now this evening we're going to be looking at uh, growing in grace and knowledge, which is in essence what we're looking at in this particular series, dying to sin and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what this means, of course, is not only knowing what it is God wants us to know, but it means letting that word abide in us so that we actually do what it says, that we are Christians, again, not in name only, but also in our lives, that we experience these things. And again, not just know about them. Now, Peter, in the context of this passage, is telling us that the day of the Lord is coming. Of course, there's a variety of views on exactly when that day is coming and whether it's near or far. I, um, you know, Many Christians today believe that Jesus' coming is just around the corner. And others uh, believe that um, it's a long ways off. I happen to believe it's uh, one of those that believe it's a long ways off because I believe there's still a lot that needs to be done before our Lord Jesus Christ can return. Certainly things in, in Scripture and prophecy that we have not seen the likes of since those words were spoken. But, of course, there is a day that is much closer to us that we do need to be ready for, and that is the day of our departure from this world. It's much closer than the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, again, I'm not talking about the rapture, but I am talking about the day of our death because death will come for each one of us. We know that. And uh, if we're Christians, of course, we can look forward to it. But in order to look forward to it, we need to be ready for it. As Peter exhorts his readers, you need to be ready, found in peace, spotless and blameless. In other words, found in the Lord Jesus Christ, found doing his will, seeking to become more like him. Now really, getting ready is, is quite simple. There's really only two things that we need to do, and those two things are included in the gospel, as a matter of fact. It's the command that the Lord issues in the gospel. Repent and believe. Turn from your sins. Begin to do what's right. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone for salvation. That's really all that's necessary to get ready for this day. But of course, as we know, it's much more than we think, especially when we're talking about repentance. Because repentance is not only turning away from the wrong things we're doing, but it's also turning into the right things. It means putting on the right things. And it certainly, I think, can be summarized by what Peter is exhorting his readers to do 
which is to grow in grace and in knowledge. Now, again, that's <clears throat> what we've been talking about. Growing in grace, putting off our sins, putting on Jesus Christ. And again, let me just remind you, it's only those who are doing this that are actually saved and are going to see heaven. So it's important that we do this. Now, we've already seen two ways that we can do this. We need to uh, stop quenching the Spirit of God by embracing the world, by compromising, by sinning. That will cause our love for the Lord to grow weaker, and as it does, we'll become less like Jesus Christ and not more. And we've also seen that we need to begin to use the means of grace. We need to pray. We need, need to pray continually that the Lord would transform us, and, and really what that means is that he would increase our love for the Lord Jesus Christ, increase our love for him, increase our love for the right things, the good things, because you know as well as I do that we do what we love, what we desire, what we want. That's what we'll do. And so, again, our obedience will only go as far as our love. If you pray and ask the Lord for that love, for that transformation, because it's something he has said in his word that he will give to you, you can know that he will. As we saw this morning, whatever you ask in faith, believing and not doubting, you will receive. Now tonight we're going to look at one more way to make that fire of love hotter, and that is through the words. As we read this passage and understand what Peter is saying, grow in grace and in knowledge, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how can you do that if you are not in the Word? Because the Word is really the only source of knowledge we have of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is His revelation. This is what we need. And realizing, as we've already seen, that there are two dimensions to knowledge. There's not only the content or the facts, but there's also the experience of those things. How can you grow in grace unless you take what you've read and apply it to your lives? Now this evening I want us to consider that to gain the strength that we need to put off sin and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be in the Word of God and we need to apply it. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. Now the first thing that we need to do is to be in the Word. And that actually goes a little bit further than just reading the word. Because there's two ways, two main ways that we can be in the word, that we can immerse ourselves in the word. The first is, of course, read it. Or you can actually listen to it on CD or MP3. I mean, you need to get the content. Or you can hear it preached and taught. In other words, we have the content in the word of God, and we also have, of course, those uh, opportunities that the Lord has made for us. To hear it preached, this is what we're doing right now. Now, first of all, reading the Word of God. That's very, very important. You know, Martin Luther was, uh, I think we would all admit, was a great man, certainly a great saint, someone the Lord used. He had perhaps beliefs, views that we don't agree with, and perhaps he went about certain things in a way that we wouldn't go about, such as his meeting with Zwingli and so forth. But one thing we'd have to say about him, that he was a man who loved the Lord and had a great amount of zeal for his glory. He wrote many, many books. I don't know if you've seen the, the works of Luther, but they, are, you know, they comprise many, many volumes. Well, Luther was asked at the end of his life that if he had to live it all over again, if there was anything he would do differently, and Luther said, yes, there is. He said, I would read the books of men less, and I would read the word of God more. And I think that that's... Good advice, especially coming from somebody who wrote so many books for other people to read. You need to read the Word of God. I mean, God speaks no more clearly nor, nor more directly than in His Word. That's the most direct you're, you're going to get it. As Calvin said regarding the Word of God, that it has the same authority as if God Himself came into this room and spoke to you that would have no more authority than what the Word of God has. And so you need to read it, and you need to hear 
the voice of God in it. Now, how do you read the word of God? Well, certainly you need to read it in faith. You need to receive as what it's saying as being the word of God. But you need to read it, I think, first of all, systematically. I mean, all of the Bible is the word of God. And so you need to read all the word of God. Read it from cover to cover, uh, little by little, systematically, until you've finished. And then, of course, once you finish, you can pick it up again and read through it again to make sure that you understand the whole message of the Bible. You know, we live in an age where people like to get things really quickly. They like summaries, abbreviations. Some have those little calendars that has a verse a day. Or maybe you've got that you know, Bible verse box where you pull out one verse and you look at it, and well, that's your promise for the day. But you realize, of course, reading the Bible piecemeal like that, you may come away with a wrong understanding because all those verses are taken out of context. You need to read the whole Bible to understand the whole message. And I think at the same time, we would recognize that there are certain areas that, that you would do well to focus on in the scripture that would have greater importance than, than others. For instance, the New Testament, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, I mean, the New Testament is the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was pointing towards. The book of Proverbs is full of godly wisdom. The book of Psalms, ways to worship the Lord and to express your love to him. I think reading those books would be more valuable to you than reading the genealogies that are in you know, Kings or Chronicles or books like that. Or reading through the descriptions of the temple or all the ceremonies that uh, the priests were involved in. Those things were important at those time, at that time, and it still is the word of God, but I think reading the Gospels is going to be more helpful than reading those texts. So there are certain areas, of course, you would do well to focus on. The whole Bible is the word of God. All of it is profitable, as Paul told Timothy, but certainly some parts of it are more profitable than others. By the way, if we're thinking about uh, systematic reading through the Bible, one thing you can certainly do is get involved in the RBT program, reading the Bible through together. Uh, it'll give you some accountability. You get through the whole Bible in three years. You get together with other Christians and you, you talk about the message of those books. Um, that kind of accountability, that kind of discussion can stimulate you um, to get through it if you've had difficulty before. So you can certainly consider joining that. As I mentioned before, you can also listen to the Bible on CD or on MP3 as you're driving in your vehicle. I mean, make, make good use of the time. Maybe listening to political radio isn't the best thing you can do if you haven't gotten through the Bible. There's all kinds of things that we can occupy our time with. I mean, Luther, it wasn't the television or the Bible. It was the books of men or the Bible, or writing his own books. But the Bible is the most important thing you can read, the most important book. And it's one that you do need to read or listen to. Get the information into your mind. And be careful, of course, that when you do read it, that the goal is not just to read it to say that you've read it. The goal is to understand it. The goal is to receive what it says as the word of God. The goal is to remember what it says and apply it that you might gain experience in the word. Now, we're going to look at that as the second point, so I'm just going to leave that for a moment. But as I mentioned, there's two ways that you can be in the word of God. You can get into it personally by yourself and read it or with others and so forth. But the other way is the way that the Lord has ordained that it would be communicated in his church. And that is through the preaching and teaching of the word. Uh, let's not forget that the Lord has given to his church certain gifts. And one of those gifts is the gift of preaching and teaching. The gift of pastoring, the gift of elder. Uh, to read the word of God in public worship. To explain the word of God. To apply the word. To exhort each of us to obey it and to encourage us to do that in order to build up the body of Christ. 
and to equip us for the work that he has called us to do. And to that end, the Lord has, as, as I've said, ordained preaching and teaching take place on his holy day when his people meet together for worship. Paul wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verses 13 through 16. And I want you, as, as I read this, listen to why Paul said Timothy should do this. He says, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Now listen to this. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. That, that's a very important thing to note. If we don't immerse ourselves in the word of God, if we don't hear it read, if we don't hear it preached and so forth, and, and by the way, we do need to recognize in these days not everyone would have their own copy of scripture. That's something that really only perhaps the elite could have. And there were certainly people who may have had copies of certain books of the Bible. They didn't have everything so that public gatherings are very important. To hear it read, to hear it preached, uh, to hear it taught. Because the word of God is what the Lord has given to us to save us. Timothy needed to pay attention to this teaching and to himself as he would receive the word so that he could be saved. And his listeners needed to pay attention to it as well because this is the path of salvation. It's very important that we know the word of God. Now certainly if God has ordained that the word of God be preached and taught in the public service for your sanctification, for your growth in grace, for your salvation, then you can be sure that he also intends for you to come and hear it. That's something that sadly many professing Christians today don't seem to understand that this is going on for a reason and we need to be there to hear it. Listen to what the author to the Hebrews writes. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, because you need to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. But what greater way to do that than to hear the word of God preached? I hope it has that effect in our lives, in our hearts, to stimulate us to love the Lord and to love one another and to do what the Lord calls us to do, which is nothing other than simply loving him and loving others. To love him more and to love others more. Now, the Lord in his providence has also put it on the hearts of some of these men that he has given to the church to commit their sermons and their teachings to writing. We have many books that are full of godly wisdom. I mean, in our library, for instance, uh, we have the writings of some of the most godly men who have ever lived. You know, we, cannot, we, we, we don't live in that time frame. We don't live back in the the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, where some of the most godly men who have ever lived, you know, that's when they lived. We can't go back in time and sit under their ministry, but God has preserved their sermons. He has preserved their teachings in books that we can read. And I think you'll find that reading their books is never a waste of time and I'm sure those of you who are involved in Pilgrim's Progress already know that that's the case. I mean, the, uh, the second most read book in the history of the world is Pilgrim's Progress, as I understand it. It's never been out of print from the time it was written until the present day because it is full of godly wisdom, and that's what we need. So if you want to grow in grace, you need to be in the Word. 
You need to be in the Word often. You need to read it. You need to memorize it. You need to understand it. You need to uh, hear it preached. Read the sermons. Read the books that teach it. And receive it as God's Word, at least as it agrees with the Word of God. Of course, when you're reading the Word of God, that's His Word. But with regard to the other teachings, we need to make sure we compare them with Scripture as we're going to see. Now, as you do that, it will give you the knowledge that the Spirit of God uses to guide you and to direct your steps that you might become more like Jesus Christ. We do need to realize that uh, inspiration has, has ended. Uh, the Lord doesn't speak to us verbally any longer. If the Spirit of God is going to guide us in God's truth, the truth has to be in our minds. The Spirit of God will take it and apply it to our hearts and move us in that direction. But we need the content of the Word. It has to be in our minds. And the Spirit of God will use it then to guide us into the paths He would have us to take. So it's important that we read the Word of God, that we be in the Word of God, and that we know it. But now that with regard to the second point, let's not forget that knowledge is really just the first step of what the Lord means when he tells us grow in grace and in knowledge. We do need to take what we know and apply it to our lives. Now it's been said that the difference between knowledge and wisdom lies in the ability to take that knowledge and apply it. That's what experience is all about. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why I added the book of Proverbs to the New Testament because the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's not something that just lays out facts, you know, that uh, this is what God commands and leaves it there. But basically it takes the commandments of God and applies them. That's what wisdom is all about, knowing how to take this knowledge and apply it to our lives. And that's exactly what Solomon does. He takes the commandments and he applies them to every area of life. It's interesting that uh, the, the people that will tell us, the, the Christians, professing Christians, that, that we don't need to obey the law of God and to obey the law of God is, is actually to deny the gospel and it's to fall from grace and it's to become a legalist and you're going to be lost. They'll pick up the book of Proverbs and they'll read it and they'll apply it to their lives and say this is a good thing. But the book of Proverbs is nothing else than the Ten Commandments applied to life. That's all it is. Now the Lord blessed Solomon with the greatest wisdom that any man has ever possessed. People came from everywhere to hear what he had to teach, to hear of his wisdom. Now he wrote that wisdom down as our Lord, uh, of course, gave it to him so that he would, so that the church of all ages could benefit from that wisdom. Now the point is that knowledge isn't going to do you any good unless you actually apply that knowledge. As a matter of fact, one of my seminary professors would go so far as to say that knowledge and application are really the same thing. You really don't understand something unless you can apply it. And the more you can apply it, the better you understand it. So he would say knowledge is application. If you can't apply what you know, then you really don't know it. You really don't understand what it means. Now obviously, the Lord has given you his word that you might apply it and not just know it. Again, in the sense we've been looking at it before. Jesus said to his disciples, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now what if you know them, but you don't do them? Even let's say you know them and you even know how to apply them, but you're unwilling to do that. Well, the Lord actually had some pretty serious indictments against the people of Chorazin, the people of Bethsaida, the people of Capernaum, because they, they heard a lot, but they didn't do anything with what they heard. They didn't trust Jesus Christ. They didn't uh, submit to him and obey him, especially as he commanded them in the gospel to trust and repent. He even confirmed it with many miracles, and it's for that reason the Lord pronounced 
woe upon them, which means a curse. In Luke 10, verses 13 through 15, he said, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for, Sod, for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. Now the point is this, again, by way of encouragement and as well as by way of warning. The Lord doesn't want you just to read the Bible to know what it says. Knowing is the means to the end. He wants you to do what he says. This is the true wisdom. This is the only way to grow in grace and knowledge. As I've said before, knowing the right thing to do and not doing it only makes you more guilty, makes you guiltier. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 12, verses 47 through 48. That slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. For everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Now what from, from this and from the example we saw regarding the Lord's condemnation of those particular cities, we're reminded that the more you know and the more you understand but you don't do, that makes you more culpable. That makes you guiltier in God's eyes. And that's certainly not what the Lord wants you to do. I mean, now, as you understand that, as you read and understand that, you might come to the conclusion that you should avoid reading the Bible and studying it because you become more responsible to do what the Lord tells you to do as you know more about what he wants you to do. It's, you know, it seems like it's safer to know less. I mean, some people have actually come to that conclusion when they understand this. I just won't read it so the Lord won't hold me accountable, but can you actually do that? Is that an option that the Lord leads you? No. The Lord commands you to read his word. The Bible is the only book that reveals his will. It, it's the only way of salvation. It's the only way you can uh, please the Lord. It gives you that standard. You need to read the Bible. It's the only thing that God has given to you to show you whether what you are actually doing with your life is pleasing to him or not. You need to read it. Sadly, within the church, we find people doing what people in the world do, which is they use the people around them as the standard of whether or not they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, we can't use the world as the standard. The world is contrary to God. The world is the enemy of God. We can't follow their example in anything that they do. That is not safe. The only safe thing to do is to use the word of God as the standard because that is the standard that God has given you and me. The Lord commands you grow in grace and knowledge. He commands you to read the word of God. He commands you to hear it preached and to hear it taught. I believe that the Lord would have you as well. If you have the opportunity and the time, read sermons. Read those teachings of the saints of old, those things that will really be profitable for your souls. I mean, you tell me, have you read the Puritans? Do you find them profitable? I do. I find Jonathan Edwards profitable. You've heard me quote him many, many times. Because God gave them as gifts to the church, and not just to the church of that age, but to the church of every age. He had them commit their writings to books so that we can still have them. You need to gather all this information in so that the Spirit of God will have what he needs to guide you into the truth of God. So read the Word of God. Value the Word of God. Treasure the Word of God. 
grab up as much of the Word of God as you can, as Jonathan Edwards once said regarding uh, John Locke when he read his book on uh, essay concerning understanding, human understanding, that he was like a miser that was greedily gathering up handfuls of gold. Uh, that image is, is how we ought to desire the Word of God, to gather it up. By the way, he also uh, felt much more uh, towards the Word of God like that. It's just that he saw Locke as the key to being able to understand more of what the Word of God actually says. Grab it up, gather it up, learn as much as you can, but make sure that you set your heart to do what God tells you to do, and you will grow into the likeness of Christ. Now, just one word of caution with regard to what I've said. Certainly, there's no caution about reading the Word of God. And, um, but there is, when, you, when you're listening to sermons or reading books, you, know, you do need to, of course, be careful because these are human interpretations of what the Word of God actually says. And I want you to notice that Peter gives a warning in that particular passage we read for our text when he talked about how Paul was also warning about these things, but he also says this, there are some things in here that are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they also do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. Now I did say that you need to listen to sermons preached and of course the teaching of the word of God, but you also need to remember that not everyone who teaches and preaches is necessarily teaching and preaching God's truth. There's a lot going on today, a lot being taught that is absolutely wrong. Now Paul commended the Bereans because they took what the Apostle Paul said and compared it with Scripture to see whether or not it was true, whether it would stand up to the standards. Acts 17, verses 10 through 11, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, who, by the way, rejected Paul out of hand and uh, so that they turned to the Gentiles. Why were they more noble-minded? For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. By the way, it wasn't Paul that commended them, but it was Luke. He was saying that they were more noble-minded because they took what Paul said. They just didn't dismiss it out of hand, but they looked at the scriptures to see if it agreed. And if it agreed, they embraced it. Now, you know as well as I do that the church today is full of celebrities. It's kind of like, you know, the, the Christian counterpart to what's going on in the world. You've got all these celebrities that people look up to, uh, these, you know, quote-unquote idols, you know, uh, teen idol, American idol, whatever it may be. But the church has her celebrities too. And these men are looked up to as great men of God and as great teachers, but many of them teach a great deal of error. Um, I think you know who I'm talking about and we wouldn't have time to name all the ones that have existed in the history of the church and even those that exist today. But people who say that they are speaking for God but what they are saying are simply things that feed their own lusts and move the people who listen to them to give to them for whatever reason. You know, again, they might feed their lusts. But you know, sadly, it happens in every camp. It happens even in the reform camp. There are those who are guilty of teaching error. So the point is, don't believe everything that you hear, but compare it with scripture, prayerfully and diligently. And when you compare what they say to the word of God, and it agrees with the word of God, then you embrace it, then you hold on to it, then you receive it with faith, then you remember it and you apply it. You hold it fast in your heart and do what it says. So to summarize everything, the point again between, behind what Peter is saying is this, read the Bible in faith and apply it 
believe what it says, as the Westminster Confession says, if you're going to read the Bible correctly, this is what you need to do. You need to believe what it says. You need to embrace the promises that God gives to you. You need to tremble at the threatenings that God puts in his word as warnings. And you need to submit to its commands. If you do this, you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You will grow in love. Now again, some people think, I think that obeying commandments means that I can't grow in love or that I'll love God less. No, when you do what God tells you to do, you will grow in love because everything that he's given us is calculated to do exactly that, to make us grow more in love with him, to make us love others more, to give us the power to love. His judgment comes upon the world because of their lack of love, because of their hatred of him and their hatred of others. Every sin injures him and others. And yet what God requires of us is free of sin. There is no sin in it at all, only pure love, which is why you need to believe what he says and you need to do what he says. And if you do, you will grow in love. You will grow into the likeness of Christ, who is love incarnate. Well, may the Lord uh, grant that we may all do that. And again, remember, it's not those who hear and who walk away from the word of God who are going to be blessed, but those who remember what they've seen, remember what they've heard, and actually do it, as James reminds us. So let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to make us not forgetful hearers, but effectual doers of what we've heard this evening. Let's pray.